In 1885, the Europeans and Americans met at the Conference of Berlin. There, they discussed the future of Africa, in the wake of Germany and Belgium in particular taking colonies. Their arrival in the continent seemingly panicked the older empires, and this is evident by the Betwena Land expedition, which took place while the powers were meeting in Berlin. This British expedition saw 4,000 men march north from Cape Town to modern-day Botswana. On the way there, they took over the new Boer Republic of Stellaland without any bloodshed, while to the north, Botswana was home to a number of different tribes. Most of them were Tswana people. One of the largest of these groups was the Bamangwato, and they were under the leadership of Kama III, who most famously converted to Christianity and fought a number of wars against his political rivals to keep Botswana Christian. But there was also Kagosi Garbaroni, who ruled the Tlokwa people, and he lived until he was 106 years old. But as for Kama, like some of the other leaders, he grew wary of Boer expansion, and even the expansion of the Germans who had set up camp in Namibia and the Matabele Africans to the north of him. So when the British arrived, although some resisted, most fell under British protection. This after all was ultimately the goal of the expedition, to prevent the Germans or even the Boers encircling the British Cape Colony. The local rulers in Botswana for the most part kept their position, despite the likes of Cecil Rhodes advocating for complete annexation and incorporation into the Cape Colony. But to the north, in East Africa, the British and Germans were willing to work together and establish spheres of influence through a treaty in 1886. But this land, which would go on to become Tanzania and Kenya, was up until that point controlled by Oman. Under Said bin Sultan, the capital was actually moved from Muscat to Zanzibar, and he expanded his holdings by taking Mombasa in 1837. However, he died in the 1850s, and two of his sons split up the kingdom between Oman and Zanzibar, which was taken over by Majib bin Said. So Zanzibar was then an independent country, ruling over the east coast of Africa. But under Karl Peters, the Germans had already established a protectorate in the hinterland of Tanzania. Plus, the Germans had also signed an agreement with the rulers of Vituland. Now this state had broke away from the Arab rulers who ruled in Zanzibar, and became a safe haven for runaway slaves. Incensed by this, the sultans of Zanzibar launched many attacks and slave raids, but this just pushed them into accepting German protection. The new sultan of Zanzibar, Bargash bin Said, however refused to accept the loss of his mainland territories. But he died in 1888, and his brother, Khalifa bin Said, was all too happy to acknowledge European control, especially as there were British and German ships in the area. This takeover, however, wasn't peaceful though, as both Swahili people and Arabs united behind a man named Abu Shiri and rebelled. But the Germans had already formed the Schutztruppe, a force made up of Africans, otherwise known as the Ashkari, and they helped quell this rebellion. Yet I hesitate to say local Africans, because many of the soldiers active in this campaign were employed from as far away as Egypt or across the border in Portuguese Mozambique. So now the British and Germans were expanding in South and East Africa, but further north still, along the coast of Somalia, the British also made claims around the same time. Now the last time I mentioned Somalia, there was the Adal and Adjuran Sultanate, but they had long gone. The Somalis in fact had lost territory to the Ethiopians, and suffered from raids from the Oromo people who had been migrating north. But in the place of these old sultanates sprang a number of new smaller sultanates like Isaac. They had actually fought the British way back in the 1820s. At that time, the British were active in the Red Sea and Persian Gulf and forced the leaders of what would become the UAE under their protection after the Persian Gulf campaign. But while one of their ships was docked in the important trading city of Berbera, the locals attacked and killed them, prompting a blockade and assault on the city. Then, as would be the case with most of these Somali sultanates, there was infighting, clan disputes and fracturing. Many of these Somali clans, like the Ogaden, now lay outside of what would become Somalia, while inside the country, many of the clan disputes remain. For instance, in the 20th century, President Bara and his Darod clan committed genocide against the Asak tribe of the north. So, in the late 19th century, there were a lot of new sultanates springing up. For instance, the Habia Yunus Sultanate would eventually break off from the larger Isaac Sultanate. Then, on the tip of the Horn of Somalia, there was the Marjatine Sultanate, which was then led by Osman Mahamud. But there was even challenges to his throne, notably from his cousin, Yusuf Ali Kananid. Yusuf was initially unsuccessful and forced to flee to Yemen, but he returned with Yemeni soldiers and created his own sultanate to the south, the Hobyo Sultanate, in 1878, just before the scramble took place. Then, in between Isaac and Marjatine, you had the Warsan Ghali, and in the far south, the Geladi, 
who were so powerful in the 1870s that they sailed to Zanzibar, attacked the city, freed some slaves and extracted tribute. Well, by 1887, the British had signed treaties with the sultans of Isak, Habia Yunis and Warsangali. Initially, these formed British Somalia and they fell under the control of British India. And this resource poor region was often ignored by the British, as it mainly just supplied some meat to their base in Aden. But they would later lose a lot of men and resources, fighting the dervish movement a decade or so later. Many of the leaders who once signed a treaty with the British, like Mahmoud Ali Shia of Warsangali, backed the rebellion and would be exiled as a result. Plus, just as a side note, he was another ruler who saw the end of colonialism as he lived until 1960. So very similar to Ungaliforo of the Congo if you watched the last episode. Then just one year after they all signed treaties with the British, Yusuf Ali Kanadid of Hobyo and Osman Mahmoud of Marjatin signed a treaty with the Italians. But this was largely just to protect themselves and use the Italians to seek out support in their own expansionist ambitions. So like the British, they left the local rulers in power and left the territories largely alone. Nevertheless, the Italians had succeeded in getting more colonies, but they couldn't connect their colonies to Eritrea because of British and French Somaliland. But this brings me on to settlement, as the story differs widely across the board. But in these early days, the number of Europeans in the area was remarkably small by and large. For instance, in Kenya, the British would settle large numbers of people in the region known as the White Highlands. But that came about in the 20th century. So, even by the First World War, only 1,300 white people had settled there, and most of these were South Africans. Whereas, going back to this period, only 100 people had moved there by 1903. Rule was therefore remarkably indirect in most places, and it wouldn't have been possible to rule over nations without the aid of local rulers. For instance, you can take German Togoland. This was possibly one of the most developed colonies in terms of railway lines and the likes. Well, by the First World War, only 300 Germans lived in the country, but back in this period, only 31 Germans lived in the capital of Lome. Obviously, this isn't true across the board. For instance, in Algeria, the French were relocating there in huge numbers, and the new population, called the Pied Noir, made up 10% of the population, even in the middle of the 19th century. And then, obviously, South Africa and the diamond mines attracted more European immigrants. But then, just to give you one more example, in the Ivory Coast, a colony which the French held for decades, the total number of white people living there, even in 1960, just before independence, was 0.009% of the total population. To put this into comparison, there were more Montenegrin Americans in the US than there were French settlers in the Ivory Coast. Or, as another comparison, you know that very few British people actually were able to rule India. But the numbers were in fact quite a lot higher. Like in 1901, the number of British living in India would have made up 0.05% of the population, plus of course they had the help of the princely states to rule over this country. So if you were to travel to many places within the colonies outside of the capitals, life would have appeared the same as it had done 30 years prior. Again, obviously this isn't everywhere, like if you went to Belgian Congo in the countryside, you would have seen a remarkable difference. But going back to the scramble, just to the west of Somalia, the Ethiopians were also expanding at a rapid rate. Emperor Johannes came to power shortly after the British expedition in the country, and he quickly looked to conquer the small kingdoms around him. Now one interesting side note here on Ethiopia was their currency was the Maria Theresa Taylor. This would continue to be their currency until the Second World War, and you can probably tell by their name, this wasn't a locally minted coin. It was produced all the way over in Austria, but so many of these coins made their way south, that they just adopted it as their own currency. Anyway, Johannes was, initially, just really the king of one province, of Tigray. But he soon moved on Shewa, and got their king Menelik to submit to him. Therefore, Johannes was the king of kings, and Menelik was the king of Shewa. Together, they continued to expand and took Jima in 1881, and the kingdom of Gojam in 1882, and Waliga shortly afterwards. Now, they were ruling over a number of ethnicities, and often treated them quite brutally. For instance, in Hurtosa, just south of the newly created city of Addis Ababa, Menelik massacred 11,000 Oromo people in a single day in 1886, and he also cut off body parts of many of the dead. But although they were able to take over the Somali Ogaden, 
they were prevented from taking over Gelidi, as Menelik's forces were crushed at the Battle of Luke. However, just across the Ethiopians' borders, there was the Italian colonies in Eritrea, and the Mardists of Sudan. These Mardists had rebelled against the Egyptians, and in fact launched a jihad against them. The British, who had already entered Egypt, looked to leave the area as it had no real strategic value. So Charles Gordon was sent to oversee their withdrawal, however in 1885, he was besieged with inside Khartoum and killed when the Mardists took the city, just before a relief expedition made it there. This caused outrage within the British public who called for revenge, but it would take a while for them to get it. However, after Khartoum fell, Equatoria had been cut off from the north, and their governor was trapped behind enemy lines. He was Amin Pasha, an Ottoman doctor, who had hoped that the British would fully annex the region, but it was rejected. So a Scottish businessman named William McKinnon pushed to send Henry Morton Stanley on an expedition to find him. But this Emin Pasha relief expedition was a colonial pursuit. McKinnon himself was the owner of a shipping company, which dominated trade around the Indian Ocean. Plus, he would later create the East Africa Company, looking to expand British control as far inland as Uganda. Furthermore, Stanley was still employed by Leopold II, who agreed to release him from his contract in exchange for taking a longer route to Equatoria, travelling on Belgian steamers through land he would later look to expand into. To the public though, this was not a military expedition, it was just a humanitarian one. However, during this expedition, a number of atrocities were committed, with one member in particular named William Stairs killing people at random. However, also Edmund Musgrave Bartlett was another person who would randomly beat and kill people, and apparently he descended into some sort of madness and believed he was being poisoned. But he also had a history of killing, as he had killed a Yemeni man for a minor indiscretion while on the campaign to relieve the siege of Khartoum. Then there was the Irish heir to the Jameson Whiskey Company, James Sligo Jameson, who bought a 10 year old girl to sell to cannibals in order to sketch the ordeal and write about it. All of these people were also still open to buying slaves from Tipu Tip and the Arab slavers, or capturing their own en route. Their exploration into the region opened up Congo and even Uganda to the Europeans, decimated the local population through disease and murder, and importantly, expanded Belgian rule. This is because Stanley met with Tipu Tip and persuaded him to accept Belgian rule and divert trade to the Atlantic rather than the Indian Ocean. And it should also be said that they found Emin Pasha. But back in Sudan, the Mardist uprising made Massawa a major issue. This was owned by Egypt before the rebellion, but the British signed an agreement with the Ethiopians, the Hewitt Treaty, giving them permission to move in and turn Massawa into a free port. Plus, this would also have stopped the French from taking it. However, in 1885, the Italians moved into the city, also with British approval. But the Ethiopians could do very little about it now, as their situation was becoming more volatile. The new leader of the Mahdi, Al Khalifa, invaded the country and sacked Gondor in 1887. The same year, the Italians moved on Dungali near Massawa, and although this small invasion force was driven back, the Italians entered into an alliance with Menelik, who in turn formed an alliance with the King of Gojam. So Johannes had Mardists, Italians, Shiwa and Gojam against him. Plus he also had the occasional raid from the Dervish in Somalia. And Johannes would die in the Battle of Galabat against the Mardists in 1889, allowing Menelik to come to the throne. The Mardists however could do very little with their victory, as they were now on their last legs and they had lost far too many men in different campaigns. They also had enemies on all sides, and they would later come into conflict against the Italians and even the Belgians. As for Menelik, he signed a treaty of friendship and trade with the Italians, the Treaty of Wuchali. But the translation of this treaty caused some problems, as the Italian version stated that Ethiopia was obliged to conduct their foreign affairs through Italy, essentially making it a protectorate, whereas the translated version said that they just had the choice to do that. This misunderstanding would eventually lead to the Italo-Ethiopian War a few years later, but fortunately for the Ethiopians, they had a strange ally of sorts in the Russians. And the Russians I've not really mentioned because they're not really a likely contender to enter the colonial race. They were bogged down with controlling the likes of Poland, expanding into Central Asia, and they had a relatively small navy. Plus by really any metric, their wealth was comparable to Italy, but with a far larger population. However, there was a very small attempt to create a colony in Djibouti, a pretty poor choice of location 
as the French were already in the area. This whole scheme was the brainchild of Nikolai Ivanovich Achimov, who travelled to Djibouti with 165 Cossacks. There, in 1889, they occupied the abandoned Egyptian fort of Sagalo and renamed it New Moscow. But the Cossacks quickly made enemies by raiding the nearby Danakil people. The French then got word of this new settlement, sent ships to barrage the fort, and forced Achimov to surrender, while the Tsar distanced himself from the whole thing. So the whole scheme failed, but this expedition did seem to open up a dialogue between Russia and Ethiopia, and the Russians would agree to arm their fellow Orthodox people. Maybe this was all part of a plan to acquire some colonies along the Red Sea, and many of the other powers believed this was the case. However, as you know, Russia never became a colonial power, but the weapons they sent proved to be the decider when the Ethiopians went to war against the Italians. Then, just as another side note, there was another famous Russian in Africa. Well, technically a Polish man. His name was Rogozinski, and he was employed by the British to explore Cameroon back in 1882, but this could have been so much more. One of his companions later admitted, when, in 1880, I met Rogozinski, and he unfolded before me his plan of research, and one of his main objectives, of necessity hidden, namely the search for a suitable site for Polish colonization, as a future refuge for those who are not only physically, but spiritually too tightly held under one of the three of our invaders. These three invaders of course being Germany, Austria and Russia. So a homeland for Polish refugees in the heartland of Africa could well have been a possibility, but it wasn't to be. Yet keeping in West Africa, there was more British expansion there, near their Lagos colony. Here the Royal Niger Company set up a protectorate, and this was confirmed at the Conference of Berlin. In this whole area, British expansion was largely headed by George Tobman Goldie. He was keen to sign as many treaties as he could with local chiefs, before the Germans and Edward Robert Flegel did the same. However, these treaties were strangely broad, in as much as the local rulers gave away a great deal. For instance, in one they said, We, the undersigned kings and chiefs, with the view to bettering of the condition of our country and people, do this day cede to the National African Company forever the whole of our territory. We also understand that the said National African Company have full power to mine, farm and build in any portion of our country. Why they agreed to do this, it's hard to say. Maybe it was a fear of jihadists in the north, maybe they didn't all fully understand the implications, maybe they just wished for better trading opportunities, maybe they feared the British, it's really hard to say. So Britain and Germany were rushing to sign treaties. This made the main focus along the borders of what would become Nigeria and Cameroon. But in Nigeria, the British had already been expanding their power, and also their wealth thanks to the export of palm oil. Then, from their established bases, they were able to expand into the Kingdom of Boni, which had existed since the 15th century. Luckily for the British, trouble was already brewing in the kingdom, when King George Pepel, who was educated in England, began to change his society. For instance, he declared that the iguana was no longer to be a sacred animal, as it went against his own Christian beliefs. So he was deposed in 1883, but as we'll see time and time again, the British helped him return to power in 1888, and in return, he agreed to accept British protection. That same year, the British also arrested Jaja of Opobo. He was a former slave who broke free from the Kingdom of Boni, and also made a great deal of money from the new palm oil trade. His territory was put under British control at the Berlin Conference, but he continued to tax British merchants. This prompted Harry Johnson to invite him to negotiations, but he just arrested Jaja, exiled him, and took over a state. Harry Johnson, by the way, was sort of the Cecil Rhodes of West Africa, as he drew maps detailing his plans for dividing up the continent. He hoped to connect Nigeria and Sierra Leone to Kenya and Egypt, and this just shows how uncoordinated the whole scramble was. Plus, in 1886, he envisioned Germany taking Somalia and Ethiopia, Britain moving into the Arabian Peninsula, and Portugal connecting their colonies in the south. Yet, he did correctly predict the Italians would take Libya decades before they did. However, I've not mentioned the French for a while, and also in the west, they were expanding into Gabon. Well, in fact, they had already established towns there back in the middle of the century, notably Libreville. This town was set up to house around 50 or so liberated slaves back in 1849, but the French really had very little influence in the region. However, as soon as the conference was concluded, they set up a colony in the country and would begin to move into it very slowly. 
They would then join it with French Congo in 1891 to form the basis of French Equatorial Africa. They then tried to swiftly expand north from there through northern Congo and into Nigeria, as Antoine Mizon was sent on an expedition in 1890. But his arrival in Nigeria was met with anger by the British. So the French withdrew, allowing British Nigeria and German Cameroon to later expand inland. To the south of French Gabon, the once powerful Kingdom of Congo was just a rump state at this point and constantly in civil war. So King Pedro V accepted Portuguese protection in 1888 and used their help in cementing his control. But Congo would later rebel in 1914 and the kingdom would just be wiped off the map. So, in general, the 1880s were of course a very busy period, but 1890 also saw a flurry of activity across the continent. Keeping in the west, the French went to war against Tahomey. This came about in the aftermath of King Lili's death in 1889. He had agreed to hand Cote Nou, a newly built fort and village, over to the French. This is now the largest city in Benin, but the capital remains Porto Novo, which became a French protectorate back in the 1860s. As for Glili, he, like many of his countrymen, practiced Vaudun, which was brought across the Atlantic and developed into voodoo in Haiti and New Orleans. Well, when he died, Berhanzin, his son, took the throne. He was far more reluctant to deal with the Europeans and hoped to reassert Dahomey's influence across the country. So he began to raid Porto Novo. So the French, the protectors of the city, sent a small force to meet the Dahomey army at the Battle of Achukpa. There, 2,000 Dahomey Amazons, the feared female warriors, fought alongside another 7,000 warriors. But they were defeated by a few hundred French troops and Senegalese Tyrolliers. Berhanzin was forced to make peace, but it wouldn't last for very long. He began to rebuild his forces and equip them with modern rifles. They fired at Frenchmen sent to inspect the area, so the Second franco dahomey War erupted in 1892. This time the Dahomey and their Amazons, equipped with thousands of German rifles, were able to put up much more of a fight. Yet, after a number of defeats, Berhansen burned down his old capital and fled north. The French then installed Agoli Agbo on the throne. He was a relative of Berhansen and agreed to accept French protection. As for Berhansen, he eventually surrendered and was exiled to Martinique. But the French were prevented from expanding further inland for the time being, thanks to Samori Tori. His Wassalu Empire had been battling against the French since the 1870s, and they had even approached the British to fall under their protection. The British rejected this, but they did sell him weapons, which he used against the French, and drove back their numerous expeditions throughout the 1880s. By this point, he had an army of 30,000 men, most of which were well trained, and he held off the colonizers until the late 1890s. But the French at this time probably launched the most bold attempts to conquer huge amounts of land. For instance, there was the Flatters Expedition of 1890. There, they tried to march from Algeria through the Sahara and into West Africa. But this was a complete failure, and they were killed by Touaregs. Eugene Bonnier suffered a similar fate outside Timbuktu when the French took over it. But this expedition was far more successful, as in 1894, the French were able to raise their flag over this once powerful city. But by now, there were only around 4,000 inhabitants that were stuck in the Sahara behind French enemies with no railroad links. The Germans, on the other hand, were having a bit of a harder time colonizing areas in the 1890s. For starters, over in East Africa, although the British were able to expand in Kenya quite quickly, the Germans were met with resistance in Tanzania. From 1891, they had to fight the Hihi people, who were being led by Chief Umkwawa. Eventually, tribes turned against the Hihi and backed the Germans, so Umkwawa committed suicide years later. But further rebellions broke out in the region in the years to come. Meanwhile, in the west, the leaders of Bafut, a small town in Cameroon, killed a couple of German messengers who were demanding ivory. The Germans responded by burning down their towns, but lost a good deal of men in ambushes. Also, this really did little to end the power of Bafut, because just like in Tanzania, they would need to go to war against them again. All this isn't to say the Germans were having no success, as they did sign some treaties during this period. Most notably, there was the Hiligo Land Zanzibar Treaty. This gave the British Vitu land and put Zanzibar into their sphere of influence in exchange for Heligoland, a small island in the North Sea. Many Germans saw this and said that their chancellor, Leo von Caprivi, made a terrible deal. Some said it was like swapping trousers for a button and others in imperialist groups said it was actually tantamount to treason. 
yet Caprivi did manage to gain some land in southwest Africa, which still bears his name, the Caprivi Strip. This gave them access to the Zambezi River and pushed them closer to uniting with their East German colony. However, there was another claimant to this land in the Portuguese. Back in 1885, Foreign Minister Barros Gomes published the Pink Map, showing Portuguese claims. Then, to get foreign support, they signed treaties with the Germans, agreeing on their borders and their new colonies, with the French as they gave up claims on the Casamanche River in Guinea. Then, they set to work on subjugating the Africanized families who lived on their borders in Mozambique, and then Serba Pinto was sent on a number of expeditions to form alliances with local chiefs. At this time, the British were even willing to allow them to connect their colonies, but not to take Zimbabwe, which was a far more lucrative region. However, the Portuguese rejected this. Then, in 1888, Cecil Rhodes founded the British South Africa Company, and the idea to connect Cape to Cairo was taken far more seriously. Plus, all the way up in Malawi, the African Lakes Company had been formed, and their claims to the region were only based around a couple of Christian missions, established their way back during the expeditions of Livingston. But Malawi had experienced a great deal of change throughout the 19th century. The region was once dominated by the Moravi Empire, which a century beforehand reached the coast. But with the arrival of the Europeans, many Yao people from Mozambique and German East Africa began to migrate into the region. They were also joined by Swahilis from the coast and even Arab traders. They brought Islam to the region and also the slave trade, which was the chief cause of the very minor Karonga War. This war saw the British African Lakes Company and their Makalolo allies fight against the slavers in sporadic clashes. When this war subsided, Harry Johnson, the British Consul General for Mozambique, declared British protection over the Shire Highlands in Malawi without authorization from London. This obviously prevented the Portuguese from pushing inland through Malawi. Then the situation was made worse for the Portuguese as Rhodes' South Africa Company was given permission to administer territory as far north as the Limpopo, which he quickly acted upon and he would send pioneer columns into Zimbabwe. Now the British had established themselves in the disputed areas. So Prime Minister Salisbury refused international arbitration, largely because in the past it had always favoured Portugal. Instead, they went straight to Carlos I of Portugal and offered him an ultimatum in January 1890 to withdraw his claims. As this was ongoing in Africa, while the British and Portuguese were negotiating, the South Africa Company began to expel Portuguese officials from Zimbabwe and even clashed with them in Manicaland. The Portuguese government initially refused to sign such an ultimatum, so amendments were made, giving them more land around the Zambezi in exchange for Manicaland and Zimbabwe. Then, Carlos, who had just become king a few months earlier, soon had to deal with widespread anti-British riots across the country. And in Africa, Antonio da Silva Porto, a famous explorer, self-immolated in protest. In January 1891, Republicans used the discontent to launch a failed coup in Porto. So Carlos, who was already ruling over a declining nation and now facing domestic strife, finally relented and signed the treaty in June 1891, giving up their claims over Zimbabwe, Zambia and the likes. Yet during this whole process, they were able to get their claims over the interior of Angola recognized. But really, Portuguese influence in the region remained minimal. The humiliation of the ultimatum inspired many to join the Republican cause, and this would ultimately lead to the assassination of King Carlos and the Revolution of 1910, which ousted the monarchy. Back in Southern Africa, 1890 also saw the British expand their influence into Zambia, where Lawanika ruled Barotsaland. He signed an agreement with Cecil Rhodes, and although claiming to have been deceived by the British company, he had pretty good relations with Britain and would attend the coronation of Edward VII. Plus, the pioneer columns of Rhodes had established Fort Salisbury. From there, they would come into direct competition with the Shona and Undebele people. The Undebele, in fact, hadn't lived in Zimbabwe for very long, as they only arrived there under the leadership of Umzilikazi, who fled from Zulu expansion in the 1830s. On their arrival, they began to fight with the Shona people, the people who had built Great Zimbabwe and formed kingdoms like Mutapa. By this point, the Undebele people were being led by Lobengula. He initially signed agreements with the British, and even gave them the Tati concessions land in exchange for weapons. But many of his own vassals began to break away from him and seek the protection of the white settlers. So to assert his authority, he launched raids on these breakaway people. But this gave the British South Africa Company a cause for war, even though Lobengula made sure no white person was killed in these raids. This war, the first Matabele War, broke out in 1893. 
Kama III, Britain's ally over in Botswana, sent troops to aid in the conflict, as, equipped with Maxim guns, they decimated their opponents and took over the region. The region would be named in honour of Rhodes, but British rule was challenged almost immediately, when the Second Matabele War erupted in 1896. This began when Umlimo, a religious leader, began to whip up support to chase the British out of Bulawayo and the region in general. Like many religious leaders, like even the boxers in China, he promised his followers near certain victory, because he could turn bullets to water and cannonballs to eggs. He then marched on Bulawayo, but the British were under the command of people like Frederick Silas, the famous big game hunter. They were able to break the siege and chase the Underbele into the countryside. Plus, among the British troops, there was Robert Baden Powell, and his experience during the war was instrumental in him creating the scout movement. But Baden Powell was accused of illegally killing Chief Uwini, who was promised clemency if he surrendered. And he was also involved in possibly one of the most daring plans to end a war, the assassination of Umlimo. Although not an active participant, he helped two men in this task, Frederick Russell Burnham and Bonar Armstrong. They managed to sneak past thousands of Matabele warriors and enter into Umlimo's sacred cave. There they waited for Umlimo to return, to perform his dance of immunity, but on his return he was shot. The assassins were then able to flee the cave, jump onto their nearby horses, and flee the pursuing warriors. This put an end to the war, and on Burnham, he had a pretty interesting life, as he was born on a Sioux reservation, learned many skills from them, and would become the father of American scouting. So the fathers of British and American scouting were present during these Matabele Wars. While all of this was going on, from Malawi, then known as Nyasaland, Alfred Sharp set off on an expedition to Katanga. This land was, and still is, incredibly valuable as it's filled with resources. But importantly to Britain, it was crucial that they secure it if they ever wanted to connect Cape Town to Cairo. He hoped to meet with Umsiri and get him to accept British protection. But Umsiri, according to many, was a cruel leader, who left stretches of the region depopulated and came up with cruel ways to kill people, like burying them up to their necks in the ground. So he wasn't going to give away his authority and would never give up the lucrative slave trade. But unfortunately for Umsiri, King Leopold also sent William Stairs to Katanga a year later. He had already slaughtered Africans for no reason during the Emin Pasha relief expedition, and now he was in command. Once again, his men killed many people for no reason, including Umziri. With his death, Katanga was then brought under Belgian control. But the Belgians also entered into a war with the Zanzibar slavers, who occupied the eastern parts of Congo. Now, in the middle of Britain and Belgium, there was the Kazembe people of northern Zambia. Although the British did dispatch a number of people to try and convert their king and convince him to fall under their influence, they were all rejected. Mwata Kazembi X even met with Sharp, the same man who failed to convince Mziri, and although he got some mining concessions in the resource-rich region, again Sharp largely failed. It wouldn't really be until the end of the century that Kazembi was forced into accepting British protection, but just on Belgian Congo. In years gone by, they were willing to accept Tipu Tip, the famous slaver, to control large sections of their country on their behalf. However, when Belgian power began to grow, they were determined to assert their dominance. Plus, one slaver named Rumeliza saw Tipu Tip's dealings with the Belgians as treasonous and refused to fly the Belgian flag. He would often continue to fly the Zanzibari red flag, or sometimes even the German or British flag, hoping to accept their protection. Rumeliza then carved out a piece of land for himself around Ujiji in Tanzania, the same place that Livingston first met Stanley decades ago. He also began to grow suspicious of Belgian missionaries, especially those who tried to end the slave trade. So, the Society of Missionaries of Africa sent Leopold Louis Jobert to the region to protect the missionaries and set up bases, but he was soon attacked by Rumeliza. As another side note, Jobert was a French Christian who had participated in the defence of Rome when Italian nationalists were attacking the city. And, along with Archbishop Charles Lavigari, he hoped to create an African kingdom in the middle of the continent, possibly under the control of Mutisa, the king of Buganda. But I'll get back to this person and Central Africa in the next episode. Anyway, the anti-slavery expedition sent further troops to relieve Jobert's men, and over the next year, more Congo Free State soldiers arrived. The slavers had very few modern rifles by this point, and their leaders often acted against one another. 
Then the Zanzibari position was further weakened when Tipu Tip returned home and left his son Sefu bin Hamid in charge. But the conflict did make some pretty strange bedfellows, as Gongo Luteti, a former Congolese slave, led his Batitela people in battle alongside his former owners. But when the Zanzibaris couldn't pay him, he switched sides, and then in 1893, the Congo Free State grew suspicious of him and he was executed for treason. So he was enslaved, fought alongside slavers, and then fought against slavers, but was executed by the Belgians. Eventually, the Belgians and the abolitionist forces, along with their Congolese allies, gained the advantage. They completely destroyed the town of Unyangwe, an important centre of the slave trade, and killed Sefu bin Hamid in battle in 1893. The slavers of Central Africa had therefore been destroyed, as the Zanzibaris were chased out and Umziri had been killed. Belgian rule was therefore cemented across Congo, but this would infamously be just as cruel. It was in the 1890s that Leopold and his private police force, the Force Publique, began to implement draconian laws, turning the country into a privately owned feudal state, where all resources were collected by officials, and those who couldn't produce their quota would be punished severely. Most of the population was set to work producing rubber, and as it grew in value, the Belgians moved further and further into the interior of their vast colony. On the opposite side of the colony, the Germans were trying, albeit slowly, to push west, and the British were moving inland from Kenya. They were all about to congregate on some countries I haven't really discussed, in Uganda, Burundi and Rwanda. But as I said, I'll get to them in the next episode. As now we've reached 1894, and as you may well have noticed, large chunks of the continents were still not colonised. Kingdoms like Benin and Wasulu still ruled in the west, the Mardists and the warlord Rabi Azubaiya still controlled parts of the Sahel states, then there was the Boer Republics in the south, Morocco and Ottoman Libya in the north, and a lot more. Then of course there's Ethiopia, who the Italians had already attacked, but they would drive them back in 1896 and thus secure their independence. But that'll be discussed on the next episode. <laughs>